Today, we're going to build this, the ultimate, highest quality, most versatile, heavy-duty extension cord to replace those old damaged and unsafe ones wasting valuable space in your garage. Not only am I going to show you the materials and tools required for this project, I'm also going to simplify the wiring and provide a full cost breakdown. With that being said, my name's Jacob, and this is Semper DIY. To start things off, we have a two-gang galvanized steel electrical box with half-inch knockouts. You may find that your box needs a little TLC, so don't be afraid to hit it with a grinder and some 120 grit to make those sharp edges nice and smooth. Your OCD will thank you. If you'd like to paint your box, now would be the time. Now let's address our plug. I chose this one from Eaton. Its simple clamshell design makes it easy to install and its shape allows you to get a good grip when removing it from an outlet. I also like how it's adaptable for heavy duty cables like ours. All you have to do is remove the extra material from the locking jaws. This more evenly distributes the clamping pressure and makes your connection a little cleaner. To join your cable and plug, start by removing about an inch of your cable's jacket. I recommend using a new razor blade as they cut like butter. Just don't cut too deep or you may damage your wire insulation which could lead to a short. Remove the paper cable filler and strip away about 3 8 of an inch of insulation from all three of your wires. Now you're probably wondering what kind of cable this is. It's this heavy duty 12 gauge 300 volt SJOOW cable from Lowe's. I had originally ordered this similar cable from Amazon but was disappointed when I opened the package and saw just how thin it was. So to make your life easier I've put links to all of our materials in the video description. Now back to our plug. I had to make some small relief cuts on our cable's jacket to give myself a little more room. This allowed me to pre-bend the wires so they'd line up perfectly with their respective terminals. Now if you're not an electrician it's okay. Just know that the green wire connects to the green screw, the white wire connects to the silver screw, and the black wire connects to the gold screw. Once that's done, close your clamshell and tighten up the last two screws. And just like that we're finished installing our plug. All you need to do now is give it a good tug to make sure nothing feels loose. When it comes to picking outlets, your options are vast. Since this cord will spend most of its time servicing tools in my garage, I prioritized the standard 125 volt outlets. However, I also wanted to have USB charging capabilities and GFCI protection. Regardless, you're most likely going to need to modify your outlets a bit to fit in your electrical box. Most of the time, you'll be able to use a pair of pliers or side cutters to remove the extra material. But in cases like this, you may need to break out the grinder. Now I had originally ordered Leviton outlets from Amazon, but I wasn't happy with the quality, so I returned those and picked up these Eaton outlets from my local Lowe's. The one thing I didn't return to Amazon is this awesome metal strain reliever. It acts almost like a Chinese finger trap and keeps the cable from being pulled out of the box. Go ahead and pull about three feet of cable through and remove the knockout of your choice. Be mindful of where the indentation for the ground screw is. Your deeper outlets may not be able to mount directly above it. I had originally planned to have my outlets facing the other direction but had to change plans because my USB outlet was too deep and couldn't be mounted on the same side as the ground screw. This isn't a huge deal, but it's something to keep in mind when determining which knockout to remove. But anyways, prepare about 8 inches of cable just like we did before by carefully removing the outer cable jacket and don't worry about the paper cable filler, we'll remove that in a minute. Just go ahead and slide your box down on your cable to stage it for later. You also want to install your lock nut, ensuring that its teeth are facing the inside of the electrical box where the threaded portion of the strain reliever sticks through. One lock nut is enough, but I had a spare laying around so I figured why not add it for extra strength. Now that everything is staged, unfurl the exposed wires and remove your cable filler to prepare for the next step. I should have shown you this earlier. We want to use the 12 gauge slot on the stranded side of our wire strippers. In a second, when we strip our Romex, we use the corresponding 12 gauge slot on the solid side of our strippers. As you can see here, I've exposed about 3 quarters of an inch of wire from my ground, which fits perfectly into my ideal lever wire connector. It's a tight fit, so I'm rotating it counterclockwise to prevent strands of the cable from getting snagged on anything while it slides in. I just so happen to have some leftover 12 gauge solid wire from an earlier project. But if you don't, you should be able to buy a couple feet of 12-2 Romex from your local home improvement store store. Set your receptacles in the cover plate and then place them face down on the table in front of you. Connect a 6 inch piece of ground wire to the ground terminal on each outlet. To do this, just slide the wire behind the pressure plate until it bottoms out and then tighten down the green screw. After making each connection, gently pull on the wire to ensure you have a tight fit. Now using the 12 gauge slot on the solid side of your wire strippers, remove about 3 quarters of an inch of insulation from your black wire. Install it on the load side of your receptacle behind the pressure plate of the gold screw. Do the same with your white wire, but install it on your other outlet behind the pressure plate of the silver screw. Now to address our incoming wires. Since I don't want to have a bunch of extra cable in my box, I measured the black and white wires in place and then cut them to length accounting for the 3 quarters of an inch that's going to get connected into the terminals. 
This reduces excess and makes for a much cleaner install. And since we're jumping headfirst into this wiring, let's make it as simple as possible. I'm convinced that if you know these next couple tips, you know just as much as any electrician. The first thing to remember is that your black wire is your hot wire, and then it always gets connected to either the gold or black screw. Your white wire is your neutral wire, and that always gets connected to the silver screw. And your green wire is the ground, and that always gets connected to the green screw. As a side note, I'm covering the exposed terminals with electrical tape to reduce the chances of a short circuit from occurring. Unfortunately, these boxes have small holes in them, so it's possible some junk may make its way in and bridge the gap between the terminals. Anyways, the next thing to know is the difference between the line side and the load side of your duplex receptacle. Just remember that the I or IN in line stands for incoming power, which is where you connect the white and black wires from your incoming cable. And the O in load stands for outgoing power, which is where you connect your white and black outgoing wires. Here's a couple of examples. If you have an incoming white wire, you know it connects to the silver screw on the line side. And if you have an outgoing black wire, you know that it connects to the gold or black screw on the load side. So as you can see here, I've connected the incoming wires and now I'm working on connecting the outgoing wires. The receptacle on the right is our USB outlet and it only has two terminals, which makes it really easy to wire. The terminal on the left says white and has a silver screw. And the terminal on the right says hot and has a black screw. We've already attached our white wire, so all we need to do is connect the black wire to the black screw and then cover the terminal with electrical tape. Now that the bulk of the wiring is done, use the hardware that came with your cover plate to secure the outlets in place. To do this, I use an 8mm socket and a Phillips screwdriver. I didn't bother with a ratchet because these don't need to be super tight. The next thing we need to do is fit and connect our ground wires. In hindsight, we should have done this when we initially connected them to the receptacles, but I wasn't sure where my lever wire connector would end up. This isn't a huge issue, it just means that the final product doesn't look as clean as it could. One of my goals when creating this video was to show you how to build the nicest extension cord possible. Other creators on YouTube have built similar cords, but in my opinion they've all missed the mark. I don't know about you, but it would drive me crazy to look at this or this on a daily basis. And this is just ridiculous. Now I don't mean to insult Stud Pack or Cody, but attention to detail matters to me. And since this cord could last me the rest of my life, it's important that it works good and looks good. The last thing I want is a $150 eyesore hanging on the wall in my garage. Now that our grounds are connected, we're gonna ground everything to the box. Grab an extra piece of your 12 gauge wire and make a small loop in one end. At this point, you could use one of your green ground screws to secure the looped into the box, but I recommend pre-bending it like this so you better control where the excess wire goes once it's installed in the lever clamp. Now use your grounding screw to secure it to the box. At this point, we're ready for final assembly. Slide your lock nuts, box, and strain reliever up into position. After getting your lock nut finger tight, use a set of metric channel locks to fully tighten it. If you have two nuts like me, repeat this process. The last thing we need to do before closing up our box is to tie the grounds together by installing the wire for the box ground into our lever wire connector. Now we just need to install the two screws that hold on the cover plate and we're just about done. But before adding your new tool to the rotation, let's test it. When you plug in your new cord for the first time, your GFCI will most likely need to be reset. To test the rest of your circuits, I like to use this little Klein GFCI tester. It has helpful error codes to inform you if something's wrong and it makes quick work of these outlets. And for the cherry on top, last but not least, a brand new Velcro extension cord wrap. Hopefully you guys found this video useful. If you did, hit that thumbs up, and I'll see you next time.